Um, I'm going to cover everything, nuts to bolts. Hopefully you're seeing the first slide here. Nosology, uh, we're going to cover features, natural history, and then of course the new drug therapies. And I've got a section at the end that has um, several resources that you can use today, right away um, for your patients with short stature dysplasias. Um, my disclosures, everything I'm presenting here is publicly available. Uh, I might have written um, a specific citation from an article for a certain image. Otherwise, it's a Google image. Um, the things that I'm going to talk about, there they are some of them as you go for go forward are company specific. Here's my um, disclosures of the research that I'm doing for them, but I'm independent and a faculty member here at Johns Hopkins um, in the Department of Genetic Medicine pediatrics and the director of the skeletal dysplasia center. So our outline for today, little bit of history, nosology, all the features, natural history, ongoing and future trials. And as I go through the four main drugs that I'm going to um, highlight, um, they're all set up in the same way. What's the investigational pharmaceutical that's being studied? What's the mechanism of action? What were the preclinical data that prompted the human trial to happen? And then what's the current status? What's been published or publicly out there about results and the delivery modality for that particular um, IP and then the resources that I mentioned. So organization. So before the 1970s, um, there's a list of several people here and many others also who um, were recognizing that individuals with short stature weren't just in one of two groups. There weren't just folks with achondroplasia, longer trunk, shorter limbs, and individuals with a little bit um, shorter trunk because of spine involvement that had additional features as part of the lysosomal storage diseases. And there was a recognition that um, all of these conditions really needed to be organized in some way so that people were categorized best and optimized uh, care and research for these different conditions. So the very first nosology came out in 1970 and for a reference point here, I, I just picked out a few of them because now we have the 12th edition. So I hit some highlights there. The very first one had 122 disorders in it. And there was only one at that time in 1970 that the genetic cause was actually known. So Turner syndrome was included within the genetic skeletal disorders. And that was the only one that was known. And you can see the, how it changed over time till our most recent one has 771 um, different genetic skeletal disorders. And there are over 500 genes that cause those particular conditions because there are some that can cause more than one. And now we know um, over 99% of the genetic cause for genetic skeletal conditions. So if you look at the whole group there in our current nosology, the 771, you can break the conditions down into these three big buckets. And there's little bits of overlap, but this is a good way to organize things. The dysplasias, the metabolic bone conditions and the dysostosis. So basically dysplasias are conditions and there's about um, 300 or so, maybe up to 400 if you consider, again, some of that overlap where the cartilage or the bone itself, the bony backbone, and the two examples to keep in mind here, achondroplasia of achondrodysplasia and osteogenesis imperfecta where the bone is abnormal, that's in your dysplasia group. And in general, all of these things are sort of gray areas, but in general, there are abnormalities of the bones from head to toe, basically all affected and all um, related to some level of short stature. Metabolic bone conditions, good ones to keep in mind, all the various forms of rickets, hypophosphatasia, that's a good example. We're not really gonna talk about those. Many other speakers you know, at different times will fit in those categories. Um, we're gonna focus on the dysplasia and clearly achondroplasia mostly. And then that third category are dysostoses. So those are basically bone conditions where it's not every bone head to toe, but it's a specific collection or group or area. So craniosynostosis or nail patella syndrome by the name the patellar abnormal. Of course, these individuals have elbow abnormalities and things too, and iliac horns and things like that, but it's not a head to toe um, condition basically. And if you put all of those dysplasias together individually, they're kind of rare. Achondroplasia is the most common, um, thought to happen in one to twenty out of one in twenty to thirty thousand people, all the way up to one out of a hundred thousand to one out of a million. But collectively, and again, this is kind of an ish thing because we don't have like a perfect large national every genetic skeletal condition short stature dysplasia to put together. 
we think maybe like one in 4,000 to one in 5,000 people have one of these short stature um, dysplasias. Total broad severity spectrum all the way from prenatal lethal up to just borderline short stature. So a little bit short compared to what you'd expect for genetic potential. In general, we use a cutoff of 4.4 feet, 10 inches as the borderline for short stature. That's kind of rooted out of the fact that minus two standard deviations for a typical adult female is around that. So again, kind of a gray area there. In general, growth hormone isn't terribly effective. Um, there are exceptions to that. Conditions where shocks gene, the shocks gene is involved. So Turner syndrome or isolated um, pathogenic variants in shocks, it can be effective then. And some evidence, perhaps in hypochondroplasia, that growth hormone could have some effect. And um, I always want to highlight unique genetic counseling considerations because thankfully, because of a lot of the patient support groups, um, individuals are meeting each other and that's changing and adding to our genetic counseling issues that we need to talk through in terms of the risk of passing on perhaps two um, short stature dysplasias to offspring. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if you filled up a whole football stadium full of short statured individuals with dysplasias, probably around 60%-ish would have achondroplasia. I have to note that this is the Ohio State University um, football field, because that's my team. Um, if you add another 10 to, let's say, 20 short stature dysplasias, now you're probably up in the 90 to 95% range. Um, there's a lot of dysplasias in that last little 5, 10, 15% over there. Um, and those folks, we, we have genetic diagnoses for many of them. There aren't the same types of um, natural history that's known necessarily for all of them. Um, frankly, some of the, those are some of the more interesting dysplasias to try to diagnose and to um, help to manage. Um, but to give you a flavor for things, this is a, a list of the most common I would put there. Um, I do particular highlight here to OI. Um, my approach to this is definitely coming from the short stature perspective and through the LPA. And um, there are a lot of folks with osteogenesis imperfecta that don't necessarily identify there. So if you looked at the numbers of people in LPA, maybe there wouldn't be as many people with OI as you would think, um, because it is one of the more common conditions. But with the OI Foundation, um, those patients have their home there too, and um, highly represented. But um, like I said, if you would look just at that population, it might be a little bit skewed, but that is one of the more common groups. Very basic do's and don'ts. Always want to throw this out there. Do's, good terms to use. Short stature, little person, LP, dwarf, skeletal dysplasia. And then from a genetic medicine, genetic counseling standpoint, using first person terminology, Mary is a patient with achondroplasia. Um, we don't use the term normal to describe height. Um, I'm an average stature person. A lot of my patients are short statured. If I was normal stature, they'd be abnormal. They're not abnormal. They're just short statured. So we make it a point to talk in that way. Um, it is very hard to talk about the structure of bones or joints or uh, foramina or something without using the term normal and abnormal. It's kind of hard not to do that, but just in reference to people, I'm trying to avoid that. Um, midget is considered extremely derogatory in the community. It sort of um, conjures up uh, like the circusy side sideshow type background, and so that's not um, accepted at all. The term disease, a lot of people don't love that, and then these non first person uses of the word. All right, so we've gone through number one out of five. Achondroplasia. I'm going to hit physical features, complications, and management. This list is set up a bit from head to toe. And then the next few slides go through um, a feature, the problem that it causes, and then ways that it's managed. So in general, um, individuals not treated with any type of growth modulating um, therapies, whether that be surgery or medications, um, adult final height is usually in that minus four to minus six standard deviation range. Macrocephaly, a true macrocephaly, like off the charts for average stature and um, certainly relative to height and to weight is common with frontal bossing. That's a portion of the forehead being more prominent. Mid-face hypoplasia, the portion between the eyes and the lower part of the mouth being recessed. Rhizomelia, rhizo meaning the root of the limbs are a little bit more effective than the middle mesomelic portion, but 
true that all segments, rhizo, meso, and acro, the distal part of the upper and lower extremities are affected. Decreased elbow extension, not really um, a dislocation outright, but it's really the way the radius ulna and humerus sort of come together um, that there isn't full extension. And um, that's been interesting to watch over the course of these trials because there uh, appears to be like some kind of growth that's happening in those bones there that actually is changing that part of the natural history and there's a little bit more elbow extension. Brachydactyly, short fingers, trident hands, thoracolumbar kyphosis, so a curving out there, the lordosis that you can see in that lateral picture of the little girl down there at the bottom, Genu varus deformity is common. There can be some valgus deformity, but typically it's varus with tibial bowing and fibular overgrowth. And achondroplasia is a ma tapheseal dysplasia. So that little drawing there um, is circled around the ma tapheses being abnormal. So complications, uh, co features, complications, and then treatment. So a small misshapen frame of magnum is common in achondroplasia. Everyone has some component of it. Um, those are two skulls from the bottom looking up with the face down. You can see how different the frame of magnum is on the right there for the individual with achondroplasia as compared to an average stature individual. The stenosis that can happen in that area at the frame of magnum and the upper part of the cervical um, spine can cause brainstem compression and cause clonus, hyperreflexia, paresis, central sleep apnea, and even death. And at times, um, a cervical medullary decompression is needed. And that lateral view of the child there, hopefully you can see right at that junction between the brain and the cervical cord that um, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, extremely narrow. Obstructive and central sleep apnea can cause hypoxia and hypercarbia. And that can often be treated with tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and sometimes CPAP, which is that picture there is needed if there's a refractory hypoxia or hypercarbia that's associated um, for that individual. Um, going a little bit further down, spinal stenosis. Everyone with achondroplasia has some component of spinal stenosis. It's exacerbated by um, the portion in the lower part of the lumbar spine that doesn't widen out the same way it does in an average stature individual. So the pedicles are actually narrowing and the foramina itself are even smaller. And then there's that accentuated lordosis that you can see there in that lateral picture, causing pain, fatigue, claudication, and sometimes incontinence. Sometimes weight loss and physical therapy can stave, off, stave that off, but quite often in adults, um, surgical decompression is needed. A TL kyphosis, again, a little component of that is present in virtually everyone with achondroplasia. It's just that over time, as that child gets better strength and tone and they're more upright, that that really goes away, even though there's a little bit of a deformity usually at that junction of the thorac thoracic and lumbar area or right into those top two uh, lumbar vertebra. Um, we tell all of our families to avoid unsupported sitting uh, because that pressure uh, down on the spine when it's not quite ready to manage the size of the head uh, can cause some fixation of that TL kyphosis. And at times bracing or laminectomy or fusion is needed. In the lower extremities, then you can have deformities of the genu varus and tibial bowing, causing pain and malalignment, decrease in activity for those individuals, and sometimes osteotomies, surgical osteotomies, sometimes eight plates, which are less little clips um, for epiphysiodesis that will clip the growth plate either on the outside to allow more growth on the inside or on the inside of the epiphyses of the distal femur or proximal tibia that allows more growth externally and you'll have guided growth or, or straight let, um, straightening of the lower extremities. Sometimes weight loss can help with that as well, but once it's progressed to a place like what you're seeing in that picture, you usually need surgical intervention. Recurrent otitis media with chronic middle ear fluid can cause hearing loss, speech delay. We don't expect language delay for anyone with um, achondroplasia. If someone has any component of delays beyond motor skills being delayed as compared to average stature kids, it's important to use developmental charts that are appropriate for achondroplasia to gauge that appropriately. We don't expect other delays uh, particularly in speech. And when that's there, very often is from middle ear fluid and issues with um, uh, not hearing well. So tympanostomy tube placement, hearing aids, preferential seating, all of these things might be needed. Jugular ball dehiscence. This is a really rare occurrence, but I always want to throw this out here. Um, the base of the skull um, is just formed a little bit different, likely due to the um, 
abnormalities with the way the synchondroses are closing a little bit earlier. The jugular bulb can be superiorly displaced behind the tympanic membranes. And if an individual goes to have um, the, the trocar put in to put the uh, tube for a tympanostomy tube placement, you can perforate the jugular bulb, not a good surgical outcome. So we educate all of our families about that, that um, it needs to be looked for and look for a discoloration or even a little bit of a pulse there and not put the tube in there if that's there. Um, that's incredibly rare in the average stature population. There've been a couple of papers, one a long time ago by Rich Pauly, another one more recently, that maybe that's up to one to 2% of individuals with achondroplasia might have that complication. And then short stature, I put this on here as a highlight that some individuals um, feel and recognize that there are some physical limitations associated with that. However, there are plenty of other people that do not feel that short stature is a complication. Um, in terms of treatment or management, uh, lots of adaptive equipment are available in the United States. We're very lucky that we have the Americans with Disabilities Act that by law requires um, a child in a school setting to be, have the same access. ATMs are lower, gas pumps are lower, things like that. Um, more recently, there are these new height augmenting medications. Limb lengthening has been around for a few decades. And in some areas, growth hormone used in conjunction with those, although um, there's not great evidence. There was a wonderful meta-analysis that came out about four years ago now that just went through all the growth hormone treatments, and it probably really doesn't have a major effect there, but I throw that out there for you. Okay. Um, greatest morbidity, mortality? Morbidity, no question. It's the spinal stenosis, usually an issue in adulthood, and you can see the abnormalities there. You can see the positive radiology sign of all those little arrows showing the um, intervertebral discs really poking out there. And great, greatest mortality is certainly associated with the uh, frame and magnum itself. A key take home about this is that um, medical issues related to all these features that we just talked about really happen throughout the lifespan. We have a lot of focus on those first few years with infants and children with achondroplasia, but obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, hearing loss, we were a little bit surprised when we did um, some uh, research studies in the general population of individuals with short stature, a lot more hearing loss than what we appreciated. This bar shows it happening in 40s and 50s. It's basically a decade or so earlier than what you'd see in average stature individuals, but I tend to think there's probably more in that, <laughs> that big gap in there that still has a white line. TL kyphosis, certainly the spinal stenosis, a feature all through things and obesity is a major issue because with the short stature, you've got much less um, body um, area to put the weight on. And that really causes a lot of issues later down the road. We have the um, ability to see adults with short stature, all ages basically um, at our institution. And unfortunately, that's a major issue. One more take home, um, there is a significant surgical burden. I'm not a big fan of the term burden, but that's a common epidemiologic term. So please, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but um, in our natural history study of almost 1,400 people, we collected information about these four, excuse me, five main achondroplasia-related surgeries, ENT surgery, so that included tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, and tubes, brain surgery, which basically were um, um, fourth ventriculostomies or shunting, frame and magnum uh, stenosis, so treatment with uh, decompression and C1 and or C2 um, laminectomies, spine, so basically decompressions and fusions all the way through the spine, and then lower extremity surgeries, uh, guided growth, and osteotomies. And what you, you can see here is that of that cohort of 1,400 people, um, basically 80% had at least one of those surgeries. And you can do the math here. Um, people usually had more than one, so 4,500 uh, surgeries in those 1,400 people. So summary of section two, greatest morbidity, spinal stenosis, greatest mortality, frame and magnum stenosis. Complications are throughout the lifespan. There is a significant surgical burden and the um, concept that some individuals feel as though short stature is a complication and that limb length and growth hormone, new pharma, pharmacologic um, therapies can be treatment while others do not feel that way at all. Okay, achondroplasia and natural history. So how often are the complications occurring? And um, recognizing that um, establishing this sort of thing is what's needed in order to know if medications or therapies or treatments of any kind have any effect. So um, 
uh, I'll say that it was really kind of a, a, a selfish desire to be able to better describe what the chances were for various complications to happen. Um, there's a lot that's published, but many times it's from one institution or um, one surgeon's experience or whatever. And so we wanted to try and make this as broad as possible, um, fully recognizing, I'll address this in the next one, that um, the individuals who were recruited from this for this study were largely from um, teaching institutions and dysplasia centers. So that introduces a level of bias. But the trade-off is that we had pretty decent data to be able to look at retrospectively to describe this. Um, and there was the need to increase our knowledge and ability to tell our families what's, what's going to happen. But as I mentioned, important to be able to establish this for comparison purposes. So this natural history study, multi-center retrospective, I listed the sites over here, DuPont, Wisconsin, us at Hopkins, and in Texas. And um, we collected as much uh, retrospective data as we could from our electronic medical record systems, paper records, the whole gamut in these four study domains, anthropometry, surgical burden, sleep disordered breathing, and then a large image catalog. And I'll tell you a little bit how we're using that now. So basic characteristics, almost 1400 people, you can see the mean age here, de novo rate was 76% in our cohorts. So that was a relief that was pretty close to what's been published in the literature, higher than what you'd expect um, adoption rate. And I think that's um, somewhat uh, attributable to the involvement of the LPA in placing children with short stature dysplasias um, in the larger community. A little bit more premature birth than what you'd expect in average stature individuals. And we've done a secondary paper that I'll show you as a reference that um, perhaps that's related to the macrocephaly of an infant with achondroplasia. A little bit more work can be done there. In this particular cohort, um, pretty low population, low percentage population having limb lengthening procedures. At the time we were going through some of these data, I had the opportunity to work with some of these colleagues here at a, a large Spanish center and another one in Japan where they were able to assess their um, patient cohorts, noting that 60% in Japan and um, almost 90% at this particular center were doing limb lengthening at their institutions with differences socially in um, access to things in a physical way in those, um, in those environments and um, it being standard of care in their treatment centers and then rarely growth hormone use. Um, so here's the, the characteristics of the population, and these are split out by decades in the columns going down. And this first slide is just showing um, when these individuals were diagnosed. So the big zero there earlier than 1980, not unexpected because we didn't know the gene. There wasn't prenatal testing necessarily for that. But I think um, the boxes over there in the after 2010 group, that highlights that we're still missing people. And I'm interested to see how this will change over the next 10 years and 20 years as more and more and more people um, might be doing non-invasive um, fetal DNA testing where single gene conditions may be picked up, not just carrier screening like through the, through the mother. Um, and certainly as more and more ultrasounds are being used, but we're missing a lot of people still and people that are not being diagnosed until after a month, which talking about some of those warning things, the cervical stenosis and the frame of magnum stenosis and things, earlier better is better to recognize those things. So um, we've got some more to do from an educational standpoint, getting that word, that word out. Um, I've already mentioned here about 80% uh, having at least one achondroplasia related surgery. So let's just break down a couple of those. Um, if you consider the tympanostomy tubes and the tonsillectomy adenoidectomy, we had 56% that needed some type of tubes and the vast majority had more than one set. And those with a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy was about 45%. If you compare to the general average stature population, it was about 7% had tubes by three years. So that's a tremendous difference. And um, 1% to 2% having tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy by 15 years of age, and we're up at 45%. So you can see a big difference there. Um, whoops. Sorry, I think that went forward. There we go. Um, the second area that we targeted, the big domain, was in anthropometry. And part of it was because it was a great opportunity to use a lot more data to make some new growth curves. But it also um, allowed us to look at what was typical growth 
over time um, for comparison to all types of um, medical interventions, whether it's more limb lengthening or uh, investigational pharmaceuticals, how it compares. So um, these were all folks who had never been treated with those things, and we excluded as needed individuals, the rare individuals who had limb lengthening as well. Um, and we were now in the process of continuing to look at differences in those anthropometric measurements, not just length and height, but weight and head circumference as it relates to some of the surgeries. But I'm going to highlight a few of the um, observations that we made here in terms of linear growth. So birth length and weight um, overlap with average stature. Visually, it's kind of hard to even see where they separate out from, but when you do it mathematically, there are a centimeter or two different between males and females, but then quickly after birth, um, the um, linear growth really deviates uh, quickly in that by six months, usually there's no overlap. So early on, right around birth, the achondroplasia um, individuals had a velocity of around 15 centimeters per year, 16 in males compared to average stature, which is 18 to 19. By the time individuals get to be about three years of age, that drops to a steady rate of five centimeters per year in achondroplasia, whereas in average stature, it's around eight or nine um, centimeters. And um, we observed that there really wasn't a striking pubertal growth spurt in these individuals that we followed. And we had a huge amount of data that we were able to have um, longitudinal evaluation of linear growth and not just cross-sectional as well. That little inset up there is a representation of um, Tanner stage uh, growth velocity associated with puber puberty. The other thing that we were a little bit surprised to see, patients told us this, but we never really had the data to look at it, is that there seems to be a prolongation of linear growth. So um, not the same as an average stature, particularly like when a female um, starts to have periods that really there will only be a year, year and a half, two years more of linear growth. It actually goes on longer than that. And growth was stopping, in, at least in our cohort, at past 21 years of age in females, 19 years of age in males, and decreasing to a, a rate of about one centimeter per year, but still steady from 15 years in females to 18 years in males. And um, what we had here for individuals that were greater than 18 years of age, we had a decent number of individuals who reached final adult height that we had um, sufficient data for to say that our males were on average four feet three and the females were just a little bit over four feet. Um, there's a few other unique considerations when doing all these anthropometric uh, measurements and particularly for um, height in general. Um, doing a, using a stadiometer to do uh, overall height is a little bit more difficult because of the landmarks on an individual might not match up to the stadiometer itself. Sometimes the lower doses of macrocephaly present, prevent that. I already mentioned about the full elbow extensions, a little bit unusual. It's important to use the achondroplasia curves. Um, within all of our new curves, we did, similar to what is done in the CDC growth curves, take out the individuals whose weight was beyond plus three standard deviations and below three standard deviations. Uh, so as not to skew and make um, the obesity epidemic that we are seeing in average stature, as well as in this population, um, have an undue um, influence of saying that it's basically normal to have that. Um, another thing that we noticed also in head circumference measurements that 90% of the median head growth was actually completed at just past a year. And um, that was interesting because in average stature that goes on for two to three years for a comparable amount. So that first year, um, if it's going to have some influence on the size of the frame and magnum of any of these particular treatments, it's the earlier, the better to do that. I just have um, one slide about sleep disordered breathing. There's a lot of data there that we are still in the process of analyzing, but big take home measurement is that there is a lot of obstructive sleep apnea. And also what we found is that very often if there is obstructive sleep apnea and a surgical procedure is done at our sites, um, we often did not have follow-up studies done. It was um, very much so based on symptomatology, if another one was done and there was a progression into CPAP after a surgical procedure, and I think if anything, we've, we've learned that we need to um, have follow-up studies when possible to better define that. 
I have several slides in here then about the orthopedic surgeries. I'm going to hit the highlights. Um, you will have these slides available to you, and all of these things are published in our papers as well. Um, but I want to get into the, the drug therapy parts of the key part of this. So um, out of uh, the individuals here that were in this cohort, again, remember it was 1,374 people, about 30% had at least one orthopedic surgery and 20% had multiple. When I say orthopedic, that's including the extremities and the spine. Um, we've looked then at many factors that could be influencing um, the frequency or the timing of those. Um, looking at individuals who had spine surgery alone, lower extremity surgery alone, or both together. Um, what we did find is that if an individual had some lower extremity surgery, they had a two times greater odds of having a spine surgery and vice versa. And that for every unit increase in height, weight, or head circumference, there was a greater risk of having a spine surgery. Um, not the same to be seen though in the same magnitude for weight for a lower uh, chance of it. And then we were also looking at cervical medullary decompression, that's CMD, that seemed to increase the risk of having subsequent spine surgery by almost twofold. Prior hydrocephalus surgery was sh shunting, increased the risk of spine surgery, and both were over two times greater. Now, these, this is retrospective, and we are looking at the incidence of how these things happen. There are bits and pieces of it that we were able to put together and put through some hypotheses of maybe why this was. But this is a key thing that could be followed prospectively. Very interesting thing to see um, if there is more of a cause and effect or a chronology of events that we could put together. Nonetheless, um, the, the, these were the observations out of this cohort. So if you look at individuals, these are lines that um, include individuals who had lower extremity surgery, spine surgery, or both. Um, we want to, to be able to say, well, how how, what's your chance at certain ages that a person may reach for needing one of these surgeries? So you can, you can see the numbers that we reported here. At 20 years of age, um, about 40% had had one or the other split, as you see there. 40 years of age, it was 60%. By 60 years of age, 85%. And what you can see is that it was largely due to the spine surgeries once you were past 20 years of age. So it was the first couple of decades where the legs had a a role that was pretty equal to having spine surgery, then that really levels off and it's just spine surgery from there on out. Um, looking further at individuals with laminectomy and spinal fusions, looking at both of those, 14% by 20 years of age up to where you've got 70% having that done um, by the time you're 60 years of age. And then we looked um, some at, again at the associations, if you had what sort of risk did you have of having spine surgery if in fact you'd had a hydrocephalus surgery, uh, cervical medullary decompression or some lower extremity surgery. And you can see the numbers there that there is some relationship there as well. In terms of the neuro neurosurgical data, looking at brain or shunting measurements or uh, surgeries and frame and magnum decompression, I think all of us at our sites were surprised that within our large cohort, it was 20% that had some sort of frame of magnum decompression. The shunting procedures have dramatically decreased in recent years. And a lot of that, as we've outlined in our most recent paper that we've published, um, it was the norm at one period of time to do a shunt at the same time that a decompression was done and vice versa. And that um, is not the norm any longer. There was a new procedure for doing the decompression that came about in the mid eighties to early nineties that was really much better. And um, it's rare now that shunting is needed. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. There's some more in that paper as well. All right, that ties up the third goal. Let's move into four um, for current treatments. So let's talk first about um, what you expect in the, the function of the protein product of the gene FGFR3. And then if it's mutated, what happens? If you've got a pathogenic variant, you've got an abnormal protein, what happens? And then where each of these medications that are currently in trials um, come into this process. So the intracellular process and the mechanisms here in achondroplasia, this is a chondrocyte here, the normal function of FGFR3, which is up there around uh, 10 o'clock in this, is to take on um, fibroblast growth factors that are floating around there. Um, the concept is that um, once those are connected, once it connects, the 
um, FGFRs dimerize and you've got intracellular signaling that the normal result of normal FGFR3 is to inhibit growth by blocking not only chondrocyte proliferation, but terminal differentiation. If there is a pathogenic variant in that receptor, um, they're considered gain of function variants, and they are that message of slowdown growth is excessively turned on, constitutively turned on. It's turned on way too much. There are other trophic factors that are happening in the chondrocyte that's allowing some growth, but it's not nearly um, what it would be if it were wild type FGFR3. The current drug therapies, investigational ph pharmaceuticals that are um, being, have been designed to have a role in this are basically one to either prevent fibroblast growth factors from reaching the receptor, from inhibiting the tyrosine kinase, kinases that are just intracellular, or modifying C natriuretic peptide, which comes through the other receptor over there at about one or two o'clock, the natriuretic peptide receptor B, and um, that's what we're going to go through where these all fit together. So as I mentioned, um, I set each one of these up, one, two, three, and four, where the first bullet will be um, what is the actual um, agent that's being studied, what's its mechanism of action, a little bit on the preclinical data, and then what data are out there right now. Oops, there we go. Okay, so the first one, this will be quick now. This used to be a little bit longer, but a soluble FGFR3 decoy is called Recifercept or TA46. Concept was that it was going to sequester FGFs, so there was less available to um, bind to the abnormal FGFR3. Um, it kind of looks like a little Pac-Man thing here. But um, la about this time last year, actually, the phase two um, trial was terminated because there was a lack of effect from the therapy itself. So that was the Theracon that was taken over by Pfizer, and um, that's no longer in trials. So number one's out. Moving on to number two, the investigational pharmaceutical for this is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, infogratinib. And the concept is that it decreases the phosphorylation, the little yellow dots in there, at the um, activated, at FGFR3 activated tyrosine kinases, and making the MAP kinase pathway less active, so there's less in inhibition of growth. Um, the preclinical data that I can show you from here, um, what's important to know is that this is a drug that is already in use in um, the oncologic field. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors, many people probably recognize that as a group of drugs that are used in a variety of cancers. Specifically, this is currently being used and has been used to treat bile duct cancers and various bladder cancers. Um, the same substance in lower doses were used to um, treat uh, mice with achondroplasia, noting that it could penetrate the growth plate and it improved the organization of the, um, the, um, the, cellular, the cellular structure right at the growth plate itself. So the first image, second image, third image, to take home from this, you got wild type, you have the achondroplasia, and then that which is, which is treated, and the chondrocytes are much more organized. They're in those nice, uh, like linear groups there, and the range itself is actually larger. What else was good in um, this basic um, uh, work that was done was also looking at the synchondroses at the base of the skull. So I mentioned that the um, frame and magnum being very small is a key potential negative part of the natural history of achondroplasia. And if there were was evidence that perhaps the synchondroses could stay open longer with treatment that that might give more time for the frame of magnum to grow. And that is in fact what was shown in these lateral views of the mouse model here that some of the synchondroses um, were preserved to stay open. Um, this particular trial, as with um, the other trials as well, there is a six month um, measurement study that everyone needs to participate in to establish what growth velocity is off of treatment. And then um, a phase two study has been underway with an extension as well. 
um, with variable increase of dose for individuals. And um, the first bit of data from that has been published, came out a few months ago, of a six-month result annual lies from those phase two individuals showing um, an increase in linear growth increased by 3.38 centimeters per year. Um, and now the phase three for individuals is underway. The key message to know about this is that this medication is oral and um, the company that's associated with this one is QED or Bridge Bio. And because they had published recently, I was able to include one image from um, their website here. This was a dose escalation in the phase two. Um, so you could see a dose response happening here. And after the six months of therapy, those individuals in the fifth cohort showed this increase in linear growth. Okay, now we're gonna move around the clock over onto the side of um, the medications that have been developed that are basically c natriuretic peptide analogs um, in number three and number four here. So the um, we're gonna start with the first c natriuretic peptide um, analog. Uh, the concept being that by modifying it, it would last longer and so it would have a longer period of time to bind with the natriuretic peptide receptor B, um, having the action where it would eventually inhibit the RASMAP kinase pathway. And remember, that was the inhibitory intracellular pathway. So if you inhibit the inhibition, you're allowing more growth to happen. And in the mouse model, um, many years ago, it was noted that if you could give a continuous infusion of C-natriuretic peptide, you could see, see in the mice there, wild type achondroplasia, and then that which was treated, it could actually normalize the shape and the structure of the cranial structure and the length of the um, long bones and the whole body itself. Um, but at that time, there really wasn't a great way to deliver um, a large enough volume of continuous c natriuretic peptide to do that. Several years later, um, Lorge et al. Uh, worked on a c natriuretic peptide that was modified in such a way that it could remain longer. And they were able to treat human achondroplastic cell culture with the c natriuretic peptide. And it had the desired effect of inhibiting the uh, RASMAP kinase pathway and showed that you could, in fact, normalize the shape of the cranium and the long bones there. I've got the untreated on the left and the treated on the right. This is what led into um, the medication being developed for use in humans then, again, after a six-month lead-in study of um, just measurement without treatment to establish what annualized growth velocity there was. And then a phase two and phase three extension for individuals all the way up to final adult height. And um, basically the phase two study, as with other phase two studies, it showed that it was um, safe, that there weren't significant um, side effects and allowing it to move into phase three. The very first um, data that came out from the phase two a few years ago now showed a, a dose response curve here. Each one of those color lines is going up by cohort by dose. So that was a nice um, effect there. And also there was a hint here at this point that it was a sustained effect that you not only had a little bit of increased linear growth compared to baseline, but that it lasted um, with treatment over a period of time. Um, the pivotal study then, the phase three was done here um, showing the difference of 1.57 centimeters greater linear growth in the individuals that were treated. And this image is showing those individuals who were on drug therapy and those who were on placebo, placebo red, those on therapy in blue, everyone started the same up to baseline of similar um, linear growth, uh, uh, annualized growth velocity. Then those individuals who were treated, their velocity bumped up. Those on placebo did not. When those on placebo were switched over to medication, the blue dotted line shows where they went up to there and you, that this is where the data came from of the increase in the 
linear growth, basically 1.5 to 1.7 centimeters per year, depending on which sub cohort you look at. So this is the medication that was known as an investigational pharmaceutical as BMN-111, became vasoratide and now commercially available Voxogo. Um, I, oh, I have to update this slide. Um, the FDA approved it for use initially for five and older. Um, Japan, all ages in the EU, greater than two. Now in the United States, it's down to birth as well. And Biomarin is the company that developed that. And then a similar medication acting in the similar fashion of C-naturotic peptide coming into the naturotic peptide receptor B um, is transcon CNP. So transient conjugation, that's what that stands for. And there are actually other um, parathyroid trials and growth hormone trials that had already occurred with this same uh, carrier, basically, um, that allowed this to move through some of that early development um, quicker. Same concept of inhibiting the inhibition, so allowing more normalization of growth. And there were a lot of the preclinical data for this that came from those other trials from growth hormone and PTH trials. And um, then using that again in the mouse model showed that, or excuse me, mouse model and monkey in this one, and also looking a little bit at the um, synchondrosis in the frame and magnum, that it was possible to have a more sustained release of the C-naturotic peptide in those animal models. So that's what allowed the approval to move forward into humans. The phase two is still ongoing. Now there are some results. The key take home out of the last medication I mentioned, the, the um, C-naturotic peptide that came through Bimarin that's now commercially available, that's an injection once a day. This one, this is through Ascendus and it is a weekly injection. And now there's actually a figure that I can show for this slide showing a dose effect. Those are the different doses going through from the phase two in the uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled and statistically significant difference in the annualized gross velocity in those individuals in cohort five and statistically significant difference in um, um, the height Z-score between five and those who are untreated. I'm throwing one, uh, I guess I actually have two slides of a couple other um, potential therapies that are in the works. There's one that's considered an RNA aptamer where it binds to fibroblast growth factor two, again, sort of um, trying to decrease the amount of the factor that's available for conjugation in the um, receptor itself. Uh, theobromo modifies ciliogenesis. I've got one more slide that has a little bit more. And meclizine itself, uh, anti-nausea medicine, having some pot potential effect directly on the pathway intracellularly. Um, these are at various levels of um, early development, not in trials yet. And there are others that are out there as well. Uh, I have a couple more that I probably should put on there, but it gives you the idea that this is moving further along. Um, then I want to throw out a couple of resources that are available for immediate use. Um, we have published several articles out of our natural history study that go through bits and pieces of the parts that I've just shown you. I do want to um, highlight one article that was a sub-study that we didn't have intention of doing, but because we had collected enough data on the modality of delivery of individuals. So um, this is highlighting that all mothers who had achondroplasia who were carrying a fetus with achondroplasia, they all had to have C-sections because it's just not possible um, to pass the macrocephalic head through um, a smaller, differently shaped pelvis. However, in um, average stature women that had never been looked at before, and there were um, some assumptions that were out there in general consumption that um, having a... Uh, vaginal delivery versus a C-section if an average stature mother was carrying a fetus with achondroplasia was somehow going to damage the spine and cause more issues at the frame and magnum. And we were able to look at that in this paper and actually show that there was no difference in the um, frequency or the, the need basically for um, surgeries on the cervical spine. So that, that was useful. Um, and then these are the rest of the highlights of those. Um, there is also... Um, a group that I have the, the pleasure of being involved with of a skeletal dysplasia management consortium of individuals um, in orthopedics, radiology, um, 
ENT when we need ad hoc additional people in anesthesiology, pulmonary, orthopedics, neurosurgery, and several of us in genetics um, to get, we've gotten together and picked out various topics that we've addressed through Delphi processes for treatment guidelines. And these I have QR codes on um, that you can scan those in and get those papers. They're all publicly available as well. But looking through for management of frame and magnum stenosis and achondroplasia, some good guidelines for perioperative management. There are many individuals we recognize that aren't able to come to a large um, teaching hospital necessarily to have a surgical procedure. And this gives them information for them and their healthcare providers um, to how to as safely as possible manage things. Um, prenatal evaluation and delivery in individuals with short stature dysplasias, type 2 collagen disorders, craniofacial aspects, and that goes into a lot of the tonsils, adenoids, CPAP things, and spinal disorders, largely on a surgical perspective. Um, we also had an opportunity a few years ago after an ISDS meeting to gather individuals from all the continents. Um, aside from Africa, we did not have representation from there unfortunately, to put together consensus statements for management and um, well, diagnosis and management for individuals with achondroplasia, trying to take into account the idea that not all resources are equally available everywhere. So what's the bare minimum that individuals should be able to access, that governments should allow for, that healthcare uh, insurances should provide for, um, this was a really wonderful experience, actually, just to hear of differences around the world. And I, I hope that um, there are people that are still using that to gain um, to gain access to healthcare, basically. And then um, I had the um, opportunity to work on the healthcare supervisions for people with achondroplasia, sponsored by the American Academy of Pediatrics. For anybody that doesn't know, many um, uh, genetic conditions have healthcare guidelines that are sponsored and supported by the AAP. And this gives a nice table of just various things to consider and then going by age groups that are shown there, um, certain considerations when you're seeing an individual with those conditions. So just one slide of some concluding remarks. Um, have to be honest that you know we've done all this work and there's been work done for many years to understand the natural history of achondroplasia, but right now we're just really starting to understand the quality of life. And um, this is what's come up in so many of the discussions recently of these medications, the, the risk of using them, but the potential benefits, what can it do for individuals? And frankly, maybe as healthcare providers, we haven't always paid attention as well to this as we need to. So we're just starting to do that, thankfully, and um, you know, working with our patients and studying these things. Um, we must know the natural history, including all rare conditions, to be able to assess the value of any kind of new treatments. Um, there are tremendous differences in terms of access um, and also perception of disease burden. So in many places, I've, I've had the opportunity in the last several years to talk with individuals in other parts of the world that, um, you know, it's just, it's really, really difficult for them to interact in their environment um, because the world isn't really accommodating at all for them. And for those individuals, some of these medications or even these surgeries have just been um, a very positive thing for them. And that might be very different for an individual that has some more equalizing opportunities in their environment. It's been a good, good learning opportunity for me. Um, patients with complex conditions deserve multidisciplinary care. I wish everybody could be involved with a multidisciplinary clinic. From a healthcare provider standpoint, it's much more fun. <laughs> I learn stuff and I know our patients get better care. And um, a very big key take home, one of my big soapboxes that starting any of these medications, whether it's on trials or for commercial use, does not negate the need for the clinical care and surveillance that we know and understand about achondroplasia. Um, we're a long ways off from believing or having good evidence that uh, any of those treatments completely resolve any of the potential complications and we need to continue to function in that way. I think that's the last one. <laughs>